Um, <laughs> the first person who was going to speak, uh, who is Poona Madhok, we are, we are sending her the link. It's possible that she had an incorrect link. So we thought that uh, it probably makes sense for you to start off. She will, we will change the sequencing or the people who are organizing there uh, felt that they could change the sequencing just so that we don't lose time. So if it's all right with you, you go ahead and then the others will come. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. I would like to um, commence my presentation on uh, Rudreshwara, the Ramappa temple, a glorious Kakatiya living temple. All of you must be aware that this temple was recognized very recently, inscribed as UNESCO World Heritage Site on 25th uh, July, 2021. So this was the 39th uh, site for India and 40 was the Dolavira. So on 21st and 22nd, we got two World Heritage Sites recognized. Uh, that is on 21st and 22nd of July. So including that uh, Ramappa temple, in South India, we have totally five you know, world heritage sites. There were only four till I think the last one was recognized, Hampi, that was in 1987. After that, there was no site recognized for South India. For example, we had four already uh, you know um, the inscribed uh, sites are uh, Pattadakallu, um, the group of temples, Hampi group of temples for Karnataka, then Mahabalipuram and Brahadeshwara uh, temples um, uh, that is um, the series of the uh, Chola monuments. Um, so including that it was only four we had and now we have the fifth site that is uh, the Rudreshwara and it were popularly known as Ramapa temple. So I had the opportunity to work on this temple from the stage of writing for the dossier. So for the UNESCO dossier, I wrote about Ramapa and uh, I had my own team and we all worked in Ramapa uh, temple, I thought I would be completing within two days, um, visiting and doing everything, but it took almost 10 days first time and then three times. So that much was the, when you see the Ramapa in the presentation, you will realize, you know, how much time is required for anyone to, you know, properly look at this or work on this temple. And uh, one of the uh, interesting um, thing about uh, Ramappa is uh, it is a living temple. It's not a monument, but it is a living temple. So all kinds of, you know, the puja system, three times it happens every day and special pujas also take place. So this is what 
uh, the even you know most of the time art historians are only concerned with the art and monument and historical aspects stylistic analysis all these aspects are primarily taken into consideration with my study for almost 30 years i feel that without going into the rituals what is the use of temple why they built all the temples without any rituals so rituals are if you have to study the temple you have to look at the rituals and the customary you know practices existed from the time of its inception to the present day this is what you know i always look at the temple from that perspective not just as a monument or with the stylistic analysis that is part of it so i always say that you know it is like hardware and software you have hardware as the temple in the structure edifice we see everything tangible we can touch and feel but what is the software is the ritual system so that is intangible so only when intangible values are understood i think the temple is complete with the tangible and intangible analysis that is what i did for this temple and uh, without that i think you know if we had submitted our dossier probably we would have rejected again so it was the human values and the practices that continued usually you know the art historians reject it because it is religious it's not so the very existence of the temple we have to understand its eminence from that perspective and the study will be complete so i made so many visits to do this kind of you know complete analysis of this temple and i'm thankful to unesco authorities that they respected uh, this study and you know it has been accorded i'm very thankful to archaeological survey of india who took it and initiated in every process and the heritage department of telangana and finally the nod from the unesco so i am thankful to my country for all the services i have done in this field for almost four decades it is worthwhile working on rock friends let's go to the presentation so the ramappa temple a book i have authored uh, that is the crest jewel of kakatiya this is the book it's a huge book and beautifully uh, you know worked illustrated researched and this was sent to the entire delegation who were participating in the discussion for 32 countries and all unesco authorities that is how they were able to understand ramappa better than just an archaeological report so this book uh, is still you know not in the market maybe you know we are expecting any time it would come <clears throat> so rudreshwara ramappa temple spectacular as much for its dimensions the excellence of its masonry and decorative carving is one of the largest extant temple building edifice of the kakatiya period this is said by ma dhaki as you all know professor dhaki had done human surveys to temple architecture bringing out 14 volumes from volumes from american institute of indian studies and kakatiya style of architecture was still not recognized at that time because it is the offshoot of kalyan chalukyas and independent status was not accorded it was professor dhaki's efforts that he has recognized and he has wrote extensively on on kakatiya style of architecture style of sculpture and that is how it has become a prominent you know kakatiya mainstream of architecture we take it so rudreshwara temple we would like to i would like to introduce you the historical background <clears throat> kakatiyas ruled 300 years 
with the, the both Telangana and today it is Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. Otherwise, it was Andhra Pradesh earlier. So they ruled for 300 years, that is 11th to 14th century, built many temples, great monuments they have built. Rudreshwara temple with Vaisthambalu Mandapa. Vaisthambalu means thousand pillar. So there is a Mandapa in Warangal, near Warangal, which is known as Anamakonda. And there they have built this huge Mandapa and also a Rudreshwara temple there. There is a fourth temple with the gates at Warangal, which unfortunately was not completed. And if it was completed, it would have been the largest temple and architectural style in India at, at the moment. They could not complete it. But we can see the fragmented units of the temple lying there and archeological survey is trying to put it the way, you know, if it is possible in the Warangal fort. So the great living Kakatiya Rudreshwara temple is Ramappa it's because there are two Rudreshwara temple, one at Warangal Anumakonda. And this one, what we are talking is in near Palampet. So that is why it is called as Ramappa temple. So built by Recharla Rudra, who was the commander in chief of uh, the Gajapati Deva, that is Kakatiya main ruler. And he was the subordinate or the commander in chief. He is the builder of our Ramappa temple. Kakatiya King Gajapati Deva, he was in 1213. During that time, it was Gajapati Deva who was ruling from the Kakatiya main line. So temple is known by the name Stapati Ramappa. So this is one thing, you know, which we are unable to get any evidences for whether he was the architect. There is a Ramappa lake also nearby. Probably because of that, we have Ramappa temple. The temple is given that name. It is only oral tradition. Through oral tradition, it has been named as Ramappa temple. We don't have any evidences either you know, in any of the literature or uh, you know, of the time, contemporary or even the, uh, the inscription. So at the moment, because if we respect the oral tradition, we will keep Ramappa as the Stapati. Otherwise, it is not there. So the sacred space is created by Recharla Rudra. Now Recharla Rudra is the builder of Ramappa temple. And he kept four components in his mind when he built this temple. One architecture, second sculpture, third rituals, and four dance. So architecture, sculpture, and dance, when they are converged, you also have to have ritual significance. So all this you find in Ramappa campus. What are the unique features of this Ramappa temple architecturally? So it evolved from Kalyan Chalukyan style because they were the overlords and Kakatiyas were subordinates to Kalyan Chalukyans historically. So they followed the Chal Kalyan Chalukyan style of architecture and idiom of art, emerged as Kakatiya style of architecture under Rudra Deva. Rudra Deva is, is the um, you know, predecessor of Ganapati Deva of Kakatiya. So this style of architecture has become Kakatiya architecture and they they, although it is the offshoot of Kalyan Chalukyas, they are very, you know, politically as well as architecturally, they have become independent and called themselves as independent Kakatiya line. The surviving Kakatiya architecture is in complete form. Only Ramappa temple, you find it is in complete form. Otherwise, there are many temples built during that time. They are all fragmented. Contemporaneous to Kalyan Chalukyas, Vaisala, and Sevuna styles of architecture. It is also, when you look at or traveled around in South India, you find all these kind of architecture, Vaisala and Sevuna, Kalyan Chalukya, and Kakatiya. 
So it is the medieval temple architecture, which was occupied the period between 990 to 1334. So just to give you the backdrop of how the architectural and sculptural style emerged from Kalyana Chalukya, this is Ittagi Mahadeva Temple, Lakundi Virupaksha Temple, and Brahma Jinalaya. Yesterday I was speaking about that. So all these are the Kalyan Chalukyan. You can see the crisp car carving and the Vesara style of architecture emerged from here, from Kalyan Chalukyan. And it was followed by these Hoysalas and they formed the Kuta architecture, Trikuta and you know, Panchakuta and all this architecture. And you see that Vesara, very clear Vesara idiom of architecture, the shikara and other things, even the stellate plan and all these things were the contributions of hoysalas emerging from Kalyan Chalukyas. Similarly, sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, something is happening. Just a minute, please. I don't know, suddenly it went off. I think I may have to log. Yeah, again. Yes. Hello. 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 We can hear you. Hello. Uh, are you able to see the presentation? No. 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 Okay. You would need to uh, share screen again. Yeah, yeah, I have to. There's something is happening. Are you able to see now? Hello? Yes, you are good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this is uh, the Hoysala. And then we have the Hematpanti style that is Sevunas or Yadavas. So there are the temples which are uh, similar, you know, like, you know, emerging from Kalyana Chalukya and they have their own style as Sevunas. And now we come to the Ramappa. Now you see that, you know, keeping the, all this in background, look at Ramappa and how they become the independent style from here. So it, the architectural features of Ramappa temple, the plan shows, there are three entrances, east, south, and north. And there is a molded Jagati 
that is the platform, it raises to six feet, four inches. And all around, if you take the entire area, it is 139 feet long, quite a huge uh, you know, space. And Kakshasana, that is the seating arrangement, what you see in uh, the medieval Kalyan Chalukyan temple onwards, taller having three layers. You can, people with three you know, layers or three kinds of you know, rows, people can sit in that. And the Adishtana decorations are very interesting. When you see the temple, you will understand this. So the sanctum, that is the Garbhagriha, is at the west. And there is a spacious Antarala. That is another important speech, is a feature. Antarala will be very short. But here in this temple, you have a very spacious, more than 12 by 12 feet of uh, the Antarala. And presiding with majestic Shivalinga, and spacious Nandi Mantapa to the east. So another interesting feature of Ramappa temple is the five types of materials used. Very rarely you find that, you know, the five types of materials, you know, technically, you know, how they have, that is where, you know, the, the engineering skills and marvels of those days are highlighted here. So what are those materials? Sand, dolerite, that is the black stone that you see for the carvings, granite, sandstone, and floating bricks. So these are the five uh, you know, um, types of material used. So Rudreshwara temple displays structural stability. See, several earthquakes happened, but Rudreshwara, stands with stability. So because the indigenous sandbox technology for the foundation, which is earthquake resistant. This is very, very interesting because in most of the temples that we see, the um, foundation is usually you know, filled with rubbles, lots of stone materials and all that, then the formation is done. But here you see the sand is used and the, it has been fabricated in all the four sides and see that it doesn't leak. So that has given a kind of you know, cushioning for the entire you know, architecture. So the superstructure is carefully restored, reinventing lightweight porous floating bricks in 13th century. The brick, when you put in water, it floats. So this is one of the very interesting because the, the professor of IIT, uh, you know, Warangal, uh, Pandrangarao, he has undertaken 30 years of research on this material uh, component. So it is technically, it is one of the very interesting uh, for people to study this Ramapa temple. And he has studied this porous uh, brick, how they have made, used those material. And he even today, he shows that it is possible. And then thoughtful use of original dolerite for the massive columns, architrave, beams, ceiling slabs, and for sculptural art, because it is tractable. Beautifully, it is tractable. When you look at it, you feel that it must be a bronze, so it has that sheen and the polish, even today, it stands like that. And granite is used for pillars and basement slabs. Sandstone is used as structural material. It is pale pink in color. You will see on the uh, facade of the wall, you know, Jagati, the, the Bitti, pillar and other things. So sculptures are highly expressive quality. When I show those sculptures, you will know how expressive they are. And the themes that are used are Shiva Purana and Bhagavata. And the Ashtadikpala presentation is unique in this temple uh, on the ceiling and Shiva dancing amongst these Ashtadikpalas. And human features are like, you know, they are not like coming from celestials or devanganas. 
but they are local type. They are not classical types, but they are local type. So 12 bracket sculptures are elongated in stature. The tallest, more than six feet they are. And they are slender, not stocky. Ethnic facial features, especially the eyes. So I was surprised whether, because I was reassuring myself that they have not used classical ideal type of, you know, women or the structure. Then what was their model? It was like the ethnic, the people around. They, then, you know, I wanted to check whether it is, it is true. So I was observing all the people who were visiting the localites and people coming from the forest, the tribes and all that. I could see that the women are of that height, great height and slender and having the skin tone of what you see in the sculptures. So it was possible to see them and the eyes, I photographed some of the eyes and they go with these sculptures. So expression of the entire figure makes you to wonder such human proportion or skin tone exist. Yes, I had to believe it exists. So 26 Gajakesari, the bracket figures, 12 are the human figures, 26 are Gajakesari figures. And when you look at that, you feel that you know they are so expressive and they create valorous atmosphere around. Now this is the exteriors of Ramappa temple. There is one, um, the, the first, uh, small short mandapa is for inscription. Only in uh, uh, Kakatiya style that an inscription is protected with a mandapa. Otherwise inscriptions are in the form of slabs or on the uh, walls of the temple. But here they have given a special place and they have protected it from vagaries of the weather. And there is one Kameshwara temple and then you have the Nandi Mantapa and the main temple. This is the entire uh, you know, plan of uh, that complex. There was one more huge Mantapa was there and it is dilabilated and uh, you know, they are putting it back and that work is going on. The, this is known as Shasana Mantapa where Rachel Rudra installed this inscription in the year 1213. And it is a long inscription. All the four sides you have the inscription. On the top of the temple, you know, there is a distinctly a golden cupola was the color was installed. And it says that it's illuminating the entire space. That is what is described in this inscription. So this is the Rudreshwara, the majestic Shivalinga of the Garbhagraha, and it has ritual significance. Medieval age, that is particularly dominated with Kala Mukha, that is uh, the, you are aware of the Kala Mukha uh, sect and Pashupata sect or cult of Shaivism. You find even today those practices Ritual practices are there. Kakatiyas followed Shaivism and built temples dedicated to Shiva. Many temples are there. And embellished with sculptural art of Shaiva themes. Basically Shaiva themes you find there. Later, Veera Shaivism included in ritual process. That is what is interesting. You have two types of customary practices existing even to this day. One is Shaiva. The other one is Veera Shaiva. Both are existing without any controversy or conflict. That is what is interesting to see in this place. The Vimana is a very interesting uh, architectural uh, you know, wonder. That is, that entire Vimana is 40 feet. It is brick. That is where you, I said the floating bricks are used because they were not very they knew that it was uh, the earthquake zone. So they wanted to make the Shikara the lighter one. Whereas you see the Kalyan Chalukyan and Hoysala, 
shikaras are not found today because they were all stone shikaras and they are lost but here you find that they thought about this and the trithala vesara and the vimana wall decorated with slender pilasters and also the niches on all the three sides it's a, it's a beautiful com composition of the vimana and giving the dignity to the temple and this is the one part of the temple you can see from the eastern side of the uh, uh, you know uh, the exterior this is what i said the uh, adhisthana the jagati and the bracket figures you can see all of them in this and these are some of the bracket figures that you see them and look at the way the chajja has been beautifully treated i wrote a chapter on the design component in that i explained in detail about the chajja when it's raining you can see the droplets you know coming down and so beautifully it has been so this is uh, what is gajakesari 26 bracket figures are around and each one is distinct but they are in dolerite almost 6 feet in size and this another view of the and close up of one of the dancer so the interior views of ramappa temple is as interesting as the exterior part so this is what i said the kakshasana the people three rows of people can sit and watch the entire process happening there so this is the central hall i called this as mesmerizing space telangana pattern of square hall this one and it is 95 feet across huge pillared hall there are three parts in this hall one is sabha mantapa it is large and spacious and second is ornate pillared ranga mantapa this one central hall and this With, within that there is a central circular huge rangabhumika it is known as rangabhumika where the dance rituals took place and pale pink stone used to build most parts of central ceiling and beams are exclusive so this is the uh, garbhagriha and you can see the antarala the size of antarala it's huge in size and uh, that is the entrance to the and this is another mesmerizing toran architecture each part is so interesting on the top lintel you see shiva see and you can also see the peya figures taking uh, the flowers and other things to the god the jalandra that is what is the the lattice that is the window of this uh, torana you find all the dancers and musicians and these dancing and musical instruments were contemporaneous of the time and there is a um, uh, the uh, text which speaks about the practices and the musical instruments and dance movements and other things that is known as nrutta ratnavali by jay senapati so this is one just to show you how interesting this place is now we come to the uh, intangible that is uh, the uh, kalyana rituals that is the marriage rituals what is interesting is there is a theme which gives the fire girija kalyana that is marriage of shiva and parvati and when you look at there in this beam you see the kalyana is happening the marriage is happening in the on the sculptural panel under that canopy the marriage happens every year on shivaratri day that is very interesting see the celestial they thought at that time and we the mortal are celebrating this uh, marriage of shiva and parvati under that canopy this is an interesting space happening there 
Sorry to interject, but we will have to move on to our next presenter soon. If you have any concluding remarks, yes, thank yes. you. I'm concluding. I'm concluding. Perfect. Yes. So this is the central ceiling. You have uh, Shiva and uh, the Ashtadik Palace, and you can see the layers and layers of uh, the beams and the central ceiling where uh, the Shiva is dancing. And that is the close-up. And we have also worked on the dance sculptures of this particular temple. What was the practice that they followed? Natya Shastra tradition, as well as the Deshi tradition. And this is where the dance rituals used to happen in this large circular platform. And the local traditions also followed like Perani Natya, which was followed and practiced in those places. And other types of, you know, Pindibandha and other group dancing also can be seen on the pillars. Beautifully, it has been ensembled. And these are the Dwara sculptures, that is entrance to the gateways and which we have interpreted them. This is another Paravritta Sthanaka, that is the standing posture for women has been portrayed here. And this is the Nandi Mantapa, exclusive Nandi Mantapa with a beautiful Nandi in Dolorite. And this is one of the chari, you can see the movement of the uh, dancer and we have, uh, you know, actually documented all these dance movements in this temple. And these are the Chitraputrikas or the Madanikas, the six and six. These are six and another set, they are another six. I don't have time to explain you all this, but, but you know, just you can have a look at it. And this is the swastika, Ardha swastika, you know, the uh, Stanaka and the Karana. And even uh, we have documented the ornamentation, the jewelry and other things, very interesting. And this is one example just to show you in a public case. So I think that, you know, uh, due to that technical problem, I lost some time there. Um, so I thank all these people who are with me to work on this. And I thank all of you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank you so much. Okay, is Kunam ready? She's still here. Sorry, can, can you ask a question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, would you like to ask? Oh, I just wondered if you have a map of, uh, or can describe where the temple is located. Hello. Yeah. Uh, wonder if you have a map or can describe where the temple is located. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I should I should have used a map. That's so okay. this is in South India. Yeah. In present state of Telangana, and you have to go to Hyderabad. Yes. From Hyderabad. You have to reach Warangal. From Warangal, it is 56 kilometers by road. Okay. Look. I will find yeah. it on Google, I suppose, eventually. Thank you. Very, very great shots of the, of the architecture. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? If not, we will move into our next presentation. I believe we have lost Poonam again. So Michael, if you are ready, you can move into your presentation. Yes, we can do that. Let me share my screen with you. Good morning, greetings from a very cold and snowy Western New York. My name is Michael Calabria, Director of the Center for Arab and Islamic Studies at St. Bonaventure University. 
And this morning, I will be speaking with you about the inscriptional program of the Taj Mahal, built by the Mughal emperor Shah Jahan as a mausoleum for his wife Mumtaz Mahal. The Taj is considered exceptional in the history of world architecture for its extraordinary beauty and artistry. Within the context of Mughal funerary architecture, the Taj Mahal is also significant for its extensive and unprecedented inscriptional program of Arabic calligraphy comprising 14 complete surahs of the Quran and assorted verses from other surahs, a total of 241 verses or ayat making it the most extensive inscriptional program of any Mughal monument, any Islamic monument in South Asia, and indeed in the entire world. In my study of the Taj text published recently by Ibi Torres Bloomsbury, I endeavor to fill a lacuna in the prodigious research that has been done on the architecture of the Taj Mahal but which has largely ignored its, its inscriptions or treated them minimally in a few pages at best. In the short time we have this morning, I want to speak simply about a few of the surahs or chapters from the Quran that are inscribed within the Taj Mahal complex and briefly discuss the reasons for their selection, their significance, and what they might have meant for Shah Jahan. A complete analysis of all the Taj surahs can be found in my book. While tour guides in Agra today regale their clients with the story of Taj Mahal's love, the love of Shah Jahan for Mumtaz, this is but part of the story. For in addition to being an elegant expression of Shah Jahan's love, the Taj Mahal is also an eloquent testimony to his Islamic faith, a faith that he approached sincerely, but lived imperfectly. The Taj Mahal is in essence, Shah Jahan's Quran, proclaiming the most salient teachings of Islam in a realm that was religiously and culturally diverse, comprising Muslims, Sunni, Shia, and Sufi, as well as Hindus, Jains, Sikhs, Parsis, and Christians, Eastern and Western, and Jews, European and Asian. By rendering the surahs of the Quran in monumental form, Shah Jahan and his Persian calligrapher, Abd al-Haq, later titled Amanat Khan, gave the text a highly visible presence in the world beyond the page of a handwritten volume. It is true that the artistic arrangement and architectural placement of the text, both interior and exterior, can make reading them difficult, if not impossible in some cases, although Muslims are often able to identify the surahs from the opening verses and then read them from memory. The texts, however, do not have to be read per se to have meaning. Their very presence in this form, in the language of their revelation, makes them true real and meaningful for the living and the dead. I propose therefore that we understand the Taj Mahal not only as a funerary monument, but as a monument of living faith, a faith expressed in the relationship between religious architecture and revealed text. Moreover, I propose that the inscriptional program of the Taj Mahal reflects the vision and skill of the calligrapher Abd al Haq and the faith of Shah Jahan. Previous studies of Shah Jahan present him primarily as a political figure, as an ambitious warrior prince who fought his way to the throne and then ruled the Mughal empire un until he was overthrown by his son Aurangzeb. But a principal goal of my study is to present Shah Jahan as a person of faith, as a believing and practicing Muslim within the historical and cultural context of 17th century South Asia. As in Shah Jahan's day, visitors to the Taj Mahal today pass through gates in the outer enclosure wall and enter an expansive courtyard, the Jalaukana. In the center of the Jalaukana's northern side is the monumental Darwaza Irauza, the gate of the mausoleum, through which one passes into the garden and the mausoleum beyond. 
This is the first significant architectural element of the Taj Mahal complex. Metaphysically, as someone has noted, the Darwaza represented the transition point between the outer world of the senses and the inner world of the spirit. The southern facade of the Darwaza bears the first Quranic inscription the visitor encounters in the entire complex, Al Fajr, the daybreak, the 89th surah of the Quran in its entirety. The choice of Al Fajr uh, uh, for the gateway of the Taj Mahal complex is an intriguing and multivalent one. Most authors who have written on the Taj Mahal draw attention only to the concluding four verses of the Sura, that is verses 27 through 30, which invite the righteous to enter Jannah, the garden of paradise. But the whole Sura is inscribed on the gateway, not merely the concluding verses. The Sura takes its name from the word Fajr that occurs in the first ayah. Fajr is, of course, also the name of the first of the five obligatory prayers of Salat. Even before considering the rich theological content of the Surah on the Gateway, its very name, Al-Fajr, suggests that the Garden of the Taj Mahal, that entering the Garden of the Taj Mahal, is like the start of a new day, and by extension, new life. Al-Fajr then, the dawn, announces the beginning of the new day following the darkness of night and the beginning of new life following death. The mausoleum's four sides are framed by panels of Quranic inscription that comprise all 83 ayah of Surat Yasin. Yasin has had long associations with the dying and the dead. It should not be viewed solely, however, in terms of its benefits to the dead, for according to a hadith related by Tirmidhi, the surah contains for its reader benefits of this world, and it takes away from its reader all afflictions and fulfills his needs. Its popular designation, the heart of the Quran, refers to its content, which addresses some of the most essential teachings of the Quran, the oneness of God, prophethood and revelation, as well as the last judgment and the hereafter. Remarkably, at the same time he was rendering Yasin into calligraphy for the Taj Mahal, Abdel Haq was doing the same for the funerary monument of his brother Afzal Khan, who served as Shah Jahan's prime minister. Like the Taj's mausoleum, the four sides of Afzal Khan's tomb is inscribed with Surat Yasin. Today known as Chini Karauza, it is located just upstream from the Taj Mahal and the Agra Fort. Yasin is a very long sort of comprising 83 verses, and I have written a lengthy commentary on it for my book, but I want to briefly turn to the final verse. It is an exultant assertion of faith in God, who is the source of all life and the destination of all life. So glory to him in whose hands is the dominion of all things, and to him all of you will be returned. This verse uses the verb reja to return in its passive form, turjaun, you will be returned a verb that also appears at the end of Surat al-Fajr that we saw on the southern facade of the gate in Ayah 28, return to your Lord. The presence of Raja in both al-Fajr and Yasin helps to create an eschatological connection between the great gate and the mausoleum, both structures assuring the faithful of their return to God. Each of the mausoleum's four doors is framed by a surah of the Qur'an. The south doorway through which visitors now enter is inscribed with ataqwir, the 81st surah of the Qur'an. The association of ataqwir with the afterlife is significant, considered along with surahs al-infitar and al inshaqaq which are inscribed around the west and north doors of the mausoleum. For according to a hadith, 
whoever wishes to look upon the day of resurrection with their own eyes, let them read At-Takwir, Al-Infitar, and Al-Inshikaq. The choice of these surahs for three of the mausoleum's four doors are the, was thus clearly based on this hadith, a connection which has hitherto gone unnoticed in the scholarship of the Taj Mahal. Halfway down the inscription panel on the left side of the south door is one of the most direct, personal, and poignant questions asked in the entire Quran. It is the 26th ayah or verse of Surah Taqwir and asks, Fa'ayna tadhabuna. So where are you going? It is not ask of one specific person for the verb is conjugated for the second person plural, all of you. But it is directed to all of humankind as suggested by the verses that follow. It asks a fundamental existential question about one's path, one's values, actions, and goals. The question is a profound one, particularly within the context of a tomb, for in reality, all are heading towards the grave, not merely towards the graves of Mumtaz Mahal and Shah Jahan within the mausoleum, but each one to his or her own grave. Within the context of the Taj Mahal's mausoleum, this ayah exhorts the reader listener to reflect on one's life's journey and to heed God's message and messengers before reaching death and the grave. The east door of the mausoleum does not follow the Quranic sequence established by the use of Ataqwir al-Infitad and al inshikaq but instead is inscribed with Surah al-Bayana, the 98th Surah of the Quran. Al-Bayana concludes with reassurances to the righteous dead. God is well pleased with them, and they are well pleased with him. This is for the one who fears his Lord. The use of the verb radia, to be pleased, at the end of this surah, the last of the surahs on the mausoleum's exterior, provides a profound connection to the conclusion of al-Fajr on the great gateway, where the verb is similarly used in the 28th ayah, return to your Lord well-pleased and well-pleasing. This verbal link between the two surahs supports the sequence of reading the Taj Mahal as we have thus far, beginning with Al-Fajr on the southern face of the Great Gate, then proceeding to the mausoleum's four facades to read Yasin, followed by the surahs around the four doors, Al-Taqwir, Al-Infitar, Al-Inshikaq, and al Bayana. There are additional surahs to examine within the mausoleum central upper chamber on the upper and lower cenotaphs of Mumtaz Mahal, as well as around the mihrab of the mosque adjacent to the mausoleum. But in the interest of time, I want to turn briefly to one of the surahs on the northern face of the Darwaza Irauza, the primary exit from the entire complex. It is certain that these surahs were intended to be read or seen as one faced them before leaving through the great gate. Surat al-Duha is the third surah selected for the Taj Mahal complex with a title referring to the sun and its light following al-Fajr, daybreak, and Surat al-Shams in the mosque, meaning the sun. The light of the sun is an important symbol of the divine presence and the regularity of its movement, a sign of divine order, sovereignty, life, and resurrection. Indeed, it has been demonstrated that the whole Taj Mahal complex has a solar orientation. According to Islamic tradition, Surat al dawha was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad after Al-Fatra, the period of silence he experienced after the initial revelations. Although the Sura is addressed specifically to Muhammad, it is particularly relevant for all believers and perhaps, perhaps touched Shah Jahan at a deeply personal level, assuring him that the Lord has not forsaken him and truly the future will be better for him. The fifth ayah of the Sura 
uses the verb radia, to be pleased. And it says, and truly your Lord will give to you and you will be pleased. As we have seen, this verb also appears in Surat al bayna around the east door of the mausoleum and in Surat al-Fajr on the south face of the great gate. Thus, a remarkable connection is made from the south facade of the great gate to the mausoleum's east door and then back to the north facade of the great gate. In essence, we come full circle emphasized by the use of the verb in these three surahs. At the core of Surat Ad-Duha are God's assurances to the Prophet Muhammad in Ayah 6 through 8. Did he not find you an orphan and shelter you? And he found you wandering and he guided you. And he found you in need and he enriched you. Although Aduha is addressed specifically to Muhammad, Shah Jahan perhaps saw himself and his own travails in the verses of the Surah. We need only recall that at the peak of his princely popularity, the king of the world, Shah Jahan fell from grace in the eyes of his father, who henceforth referred to him only as the wretch, the Dawlat. For five years, Shah Jahan fled from imperial troops, crossing the length and breadth of the empire in search of support and security. He found neither, and he never saw his father again. It is not difficult to imagine that Shah Jahan thought of himself as orphaned, hated, and in need during those years, just as Muhammad did during the Fatra. But blessed by his marriage to Mumtaz, who had loved and supported him throughout those difficult years, not unlike Khadija, who had comforted the Prophet Muhammad. A fundamental premise of my research is that the Quranic texts selected for the Taj Mahal not only suited the funerary context of a mausoleum, but also reflected the faith of Shah Jahan, a faith that he himself struggled to live with authenticity, a faith that he wished to declare and share through the magnificent memorial he created for Mumtaz Mahal. I have also proposed that these texts spoke to his life experience as a person of faith, as the grandson of a beloved emperor grandfather who had seen to his spiritual and intellectual education, as the son who had fought on the battlefield for his emperor father and was thus honored as king of the world, but also as a son who had fought against his father and was cursed by him, as a brother like the, who, like the generations before him, regarded his siblings as rivals to be defeated or eliminated if necessary. As a husband and father who experienced familial love, but also loss, the loss of a beloved wife and the loss of children who died prematurely. The sodas of the Quran that he selected undoubtedly in consultation with Abd al-Haq Amanit Khan spoke to his understanding of God, most compassionate and most merciful, almighty and all-knowing, singular in his sovereignty, creator of the cosmos, who gives life, brings death, and raises to life again, who judges people not according to their religious affiliation or gender, but according to their awareness of his eternal presence and their deeds that flow from it. A God who demands not only faith expressed in prayer, but faith in action, caring for the poor, the orphaned and the hungry, whose justice is not capricious, but is compassionate and consistent, allowing the righteous to enjoy eternal life in a luminescent garden of unfathomable beauty and the wicked to suffer the consequences of their willful recalcitrance in fiery punishment or purification. God who revealed his will and wisdom in sacred scripture given to his messengers, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, and many others named and unnamed. That is what the Taj Mahal preached in Shah Jahan's day and what it continues to proclaim even now. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Beautiful presentation. Any questions? Okay, we have lost our other presenter, Poonam. So if there are any questions or remarks from either of our presenters, you can go to those. All right, if there are no questions, I guess we can end a bit early unless Poonam will be coming back in. Thank you both for such beautiful presentations. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Poonam.
Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Okay, so this is uh, our director, Lewis Lancaster. He's uh, teaching uh, courses at the University of the West and the uh, Atlas of Maritime Buddhism. It's uh, how it's featured here. And I'm going to begin with the spatial humanities projects in terms of having a GIS and methods and spatial humanities to help us to gain new knowledge of regional and shared heritage. These shared heritages uh, have given us projects about the understanding of sources, linkages, and mutual lifeways. What is the worth and value of heritage connections? We find peoples have separate yet related traditions that include palm leaf and rattan weaving, pottery, metalwork, jewelry, batik, constructing ships, wood and stone carvings, and other innumerable crafts for domestic use and trade. So I'll give you some examples of spatial humanities tools. Since our research has a range of ways to facilitate configuring social science data with geospatial tools featuring monsoon Asia and as a research area and the GIS point locations, that includes migration, historical trade routes, religious sites, and having the region linked to enrich attribute spatial data information. So this is the use of Google Earth. We have maritime archeological findings. We have observing virtual reality in exhibitions. We have a 3D surround immersive, where someone is able to have a composition of surround uh, perspectives that give action in each scene. We have a survey by remote sensing, and we have time-enabled map displays that give uh, multiple language and area boundaries, including contemporary languages. It uses dynamic map display techniques capable of visually showing change. So this is an example of map overlays and we use early maps, uh, lands of Ganga Islands and China, you can see here, and uh, another kind of illustrating map of Buddha, Mara, and the goddess of Ganga. That's another kind of uh, visual orientation. Trade winds are important in terms of the seasons for sailing across the seas, made the trade predictable and profitable in accordance with winds and annual shifts of directions that mark trade calendars for ocean shipments. This is an example of the, of the trade winds uh, from the monsoon Asia region, the Bay of Bengal up to the South China Sea. So we use our digital historical stories. And so why not bring out the historical stories with digital humanities tools in terms of circulating among people of all walks of life and of all ages. This could certainly entertain and explore the data with the public to find new possibilities and understanding history from grassroots and people can learn by themselves with the range of mobile apps, stories not told from the top down. So we're finding linkages with ships, navigation, routes, timelines, seasonal winds, river estuary ports, voyaging of merchants and monks, early historical stories and archeological sites. So we look at navigation. These are the Ikai resource uh, areas that we have done, um, the networks of navigation. And this one is the uh, mutual traits that are observed in legends, um, beliefs, architecture, songs, motif symbols, ocean craft voyaging techniques, and of course, languages. These traits have been transferred as aesthetic systems across vast distances of space and time. So these are the Ikai uh, evaluation of the ports in, in the atlas. 
This is the Gull Harbor. Uh, this is uh, Sangha Mita. Uh, she is taking the bow tree to Sri Lanka by ship. And we, we show how the legacy of mound became stupa and the Fasian throughout, early uh, Chinese traveler. And uh, this is quite interesting. It shows where the megalith sites over a period of a thousand years have became Buddhist sites in South India and Sri Lanka. This is an example of a megalith. And uh, natural uh, peaks like Sri Pada, Adam's Peak, they show how the peaks have been uh, used in terms of uh, Mount Meru, in terms of its natural formation and in architecture, uh, such as Angkor Wat. And here we have Meru, uh, the capital of the column and its lotus motif. So, so we have uh, the sun, Meru, flora and water as symbols. And my studies uh, and contributions have connected Theravada traditions in Sri Lanka and other Indic resources in Southeast Asia using GIS and multimedia. So I begin with Sri Lanka. And there is the starting point of my South Asian studies. And uh, I've spent years recording dimensions of Buddhist life with multimedia. One example is given here, documenting a Buddhist monk going for forest meditation retreat. Let's see if this plays. But we don't have the audio. Uh, the sound is not operating. Is, it, is this a link that we could search on YouTube here? It's not a YouTube link, it's an embedded. Oh, okay, let's see. It's, um, I think the one thing we would have to do is security, well, participants. Share computer sound. And then you may need to enter your We try and play. Maybe if we, oh, it's loading. The monk goes to the forest to The inner peace of the self has the secret of enlightenment. The physical form of the religion can only serve as the channel to the heart of detached existence, the essence of our salvation. Self-knowing starts with concentration of the inner light reflected from the rhythm of an external object. There is developed concentration in the rhyme until the rhythm falls away. We believe in mental culture as the world is arranged according to our thoughts. If we reach the inner self by the process of concentration and mindfulness to every action, we will become aware to the whole universe Otherwise, we hold on to the smallest fragments as truth. And then there we go. Great. Thanks.
For my studies in Sri Lanka, I have expanded to other regions in South and Southeast Asia, tracing the Indic Dharma from earliest times. So this shows uh, some of the trade winds, trade routes, and the Buddhist sites. Monsoon sailing routes to Malaysia. This is the Sri Vijaya. And there is a, in that area on the Malay Peninsula, Bujang Valley, from the second century through the 13th century. It has uh, an extensive Indic Dharma related archaeological sites. And this is uh, Mount Jirai, a navigational marker to the Bujang port. And you can see how the estuary uh, invites uh, ships into the harbor. And the many uh, architectural remains there. So South Asian influences Indonesia. We have a very extensive uh, research in that area. And in Yogyakarta, we can see that Mount uh, Mirapi is uh, just uh, above the, the town and uh, also using it, its uh, peak as a navigational uh, point for entering the harbor. And uh, this is a mudra for also uh, when asked people about how uh, megalithic culture existed before uh, there was the material culture, there was the hand mudra and also in rice serving. And the, the major site there is Borobudur, uh, 8th century to the uh, 9th century in Java. And there you can see uh, the stitched uh, sea craft uh, in the reliefs. And this was uh, done by uh, a reconstruction of the ships and sailing across the Indian Ocean and a plan of the Oru, the ship as it's stitched together. And the, the same technique is used in modern times. And I've done a documentary on the stitching of the Oru in the Indian Ocean here on the coast of Sri Lanka. And so these are some images of the, of the ship in a stone relief. And it shows the pilgrims, the devotions, of people coming uh, to sail across the Indian Ocean in this kind of sea craft. And the re our research also includes Sulawesi, where we have found uh, Buddhist artifacts and um, we map them according to a GIS. And it also it has its estuary uh, points of harbors uh, that, that lead to the archeological sites. And like this one is a Chandi, it's a place where there is uh, remains of uh, uh, Buddhists who have been buried there with relics. And the bronze Buddha here from um, East Indian style. So far reaching goals of the project is to further standards in terms of cardiographic strategies through the utility of digitization content and format giving new possibilities for local and international collaborators. 3D mapping for projects to provide new guidance for developing best practice standards. And this allows uh, uniting uh, environmental landscapes with cultural data for making new and enhanced possibilities for spatial humanities for scholarly results. So in South India, the Ramaswamy uh, Dialan of the Archaeological Survey of India has contributed much to the Ikai Atlas of Maritime Buddhism in terms of GIS charting Buddhist archaeological sites. In Tamil Nadu, Dialan has found 100 sites yielding Buddhist artifacts. He has excavated remains including sculptures, bronzes, paintings, terracotta figurines, and inscriptions. The excavated sites have a geo-registered and digital uh, documentation with the database giving location, description, measurement, date, condition of object, photography, site map, drawings, and other related references and publications using GIS as a platform. These are the sites that Dialon has been working on in South India. And his book is Comprehensive Publication on Buddhist Remains of South India. So today we have 
in our present time the pathways of maritime Buddhism on display as an extensive uh, digital and spatial humanities mapping visualization at exhibitions in Hong Kong and Taiwan. The Atlas of Maritime Buddhism is about how Buddhism has developed for centuries out of South Asia and it continues to live on today. So at the Buddha Museum in Taiwan uh, at Ho Guan Shan Monastery, there's a, an extensive exhibition uh, that has been launched uh, entitled the Buddhist Maritime Seat Route. And the Silk Route is uh, on the road of the Silk Road is the new media uh, art curated by Venerable Ru Chang, Professor Lancaster, and Sarah Caradine and Jeffrey Shaw, and will be displayed until uh, 2016. So this is uh, the website. You can see uh, curators and, and how it opens into the display area. And, uh, and it gives a, a sense of, of going through the exhibition. You can go through there. I have to share to another to another screen. Hold on. How do I go to another? Uh, I'm trying to get to slide 97. Huh? To slide 97, or do you want to share another? No longer share the slides. No, share this this one. Oh, okay. Let's see. So we go. From Zoom, where are we going? So you share, and then this is the one. Yeah. Okay, that's good. And should it have audio as well? Yes. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so this uh, shows the entrance to the exhibition, and you can hear the sound of the ocean. I'll go back to that. Okay, so that is uh, how the exhibition opens and it's in, in Gaoshan up through 2016. And this is the link, it has a YouTube link here. Our focus is on heritage as a cultural resource that defines a people's ethos and facilitates consciousness of a spatial temporal area to communicate with others, thus defining a sense of place. And I have now concluded my Talk. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you.
Hi everybody, I'm Alex Amis. I'm going to present on sources of South Asian esoteric texts in the Chinese Buddhist canon. Okay, um, so motivation and goals. Esoteric Buddhism is an important belief system that I think is worthwhile studying uh, for its own merit, and there's many things to discover there. In addition, it has driven many historical, cultural, language, uh, ex and language exchanges between India, China, Korea, Japan, Tibetan, and other countries as well. And uh, esoteric Buddhism has had an outsized influence on the popular practice of Buddhism through ritual practices and art. My goal here in this study has been to discover the origin of a large number of uh, esoteric works in the Taisho uh, that were not found in the Korean canon. Given that the Taisho canon was based on the Korean canon, there is a large number of texts that actually were not in the Korean canon. The challenge here uh, was that relatively few of these texts have been translated into English or even have English titles, or there's much uh, information about them in English literature. Uh, so this slide here summarizes the uh, key points. Um, and they, uh, these texts are contained in volumes 18 to 21 in the Tai Sho uh, and the 614 of the texts. And we can see here um, in terms of Ikai and um, geography, um, we can see kind of the key uh, locations that are, um, that are um, touched here. Uh, of course, the practices originated in uh, South Asia in India and initially were transported over the Silk Route um, through, to, through Western China, Central Asia through to uh, China to mostly to the Tang uh, and Sui and Tang capital at Chang'an there, which is present day Xi'an. Later on, the texts were uh, transported and practices were transported along the maritime route here into uh, one or more entries, maybe up the Yangtze or maybe from Guangzhou uh, there through overland to, um, to uh, Chang'an. And um, from there, um, the Buddhism was transmitted into Korea and from Korea to Japan. And in Japan, where it evolved its own practice, um, and Japanese monks wanting to learn more about Buddhism um, uh, furthered their studies by traveling back to China. And uh, there was the um, eight famous uh, mon monastics from Japan who traveled to China in the Tang Dynasty. And uh, some of them went to Chang'an, their capital. After the Tang Dynasty, the translation effort shifted more to Kaifeng, which is the capital of the Northern Song. And so there's many points of interest here, the origin, the translators, uh, the sponsors, cultural importance, content, structure, genre, and deities described, but I will focus on the origin. Okay, um, the, of course, the, the basic origin um, is in uh, South Asia and it is esoteric Buddhism is really a spectrum of forms of Buddhism fused with indigenous beliefs. And the main source of this is the Vedic traditions uh, from India um, that were adopted into Buddhism. And there was also, in addition to that, there was already some elements um, that were in Buddhism from the very early times, such as Dharanis. Dharanis. Um, and um, however, the most of the, the deity described in these rituals are Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So clearly it's Buddhism we're talking about. However, there was additionally some other deities that were clearly just adopted into Buddhism from Vedic traditions such as Ganesh and others actually too. Now these um, rituals are all described in texts in the canon and in a lot of detail. And the things they uh, include are things like precepts, uh, repentance, mantras, um, mudras, visualization of deities, visualization of oneself as a deity, uh, meditation practices, uh, and dharanis for protection against demons and natural disasters and so on. And there is uh, a few homo rituals as well, which are the fire rituals. Now, as um, esoteric Buddhism spread into East Asia, um, there were some changes and questions um, that arose. Uh, and one of the questions that uh, has been the source of debate was, is esoteric Buddhism a branch of Buddhism on its own? Or is it 
just uh, some kind of more diffuse um, change and trend. And this is the so-called like capital E versus lowercase e esoteric Buddhism argument. And uh, I think this, is a, this has been going on since um, early times and still continues to be some discussion about this today. And it is relevant in Chinese Buddhism uh, because esoteric Buddhism is mostly driven by imperial sponsorship in China. The uh, Amagabhadra, one of the key figures in esoteric Buddhism, uh, who lived in Chang'an for a long time, uh, had a very close relationship with three of the very influential emperors in the Tang dynasty at the height of esoteric Buddhism. In fact, the height of Chinese, um, in, you know, one of the peaks of Chinese civilization there in the Tang dynasty. Many of these temples were established by the emperor um, and the abbots and other monastics at those temples were appointed uh, by the imperial court. This is somewhat different in Japan uh, where esoteric Buddhism had its own school, the Shingon school, which is clearly its own school and had its own existence independent uh, of imperial patronage, and in fact still exists today. Whereas in China, there really is not an esoteric school as such uh, in, in China today. Um, however, in addition, there has been a very um, large and diffuse influence of esoteric Buddhism in general Buddhist practices, things like dharanis, um, artifacts, uh, art, and so on. That has been actually very prominent. Here's a rough timeline. About the year 538, Buddhism was transmitted to Japan by Korea. 746, Amagabhadra came back to China for the second time and where he initiated this esoteric tradition as a separate tradition and um, uh, recruited imperial sponsorship. And there was a large number of manuals that were translated starting at that time. 750 to 1162 was the Pala Empire. Pala Empire was a major sponsor of esoteric Buddhism in South Asia. Uh, however, we can see that it, esoteric Buddhism as a movement had already um, arisen before that time. A few years later, 803 to 806, Saicho and Kukai traveled from Japan to China. When it, Kukai actually didn't stay very long in China, but was very influential on Japanese Buddhism. He returned to Japan and founded the Shingon sect in Japan. Later in the uh, shogunate uh, periods in Japan, um, the schools were more clearly differentiated. Shingon was one of the major schools. There was also Tendai, Zen, Pure Land. And the shoguns were major sponsors of Buddhism in Japan. That came to an end around 1868 with the Meiji Restoration, which was a combination of modernization and nationalism in Japan, um, where the, the Shogun uh, came to an end, Shogunate came to an end. Uh, they brought back the emperor, uh, which seems to be in contradiction to modernization, but it's actually a kind of nationalism rolled into that as well. And that uh, period gave rise to the, the beginnings of the Taisho Tripitaka there, which was published in the early uh, 20th century. Now, the sources um, outside of the Korean canon, um, there was a number actually, kind of a collection. Uh, we can see the top, we have listed here in, um, in order, the top one, um, the top several actually being related to um, the Shingon School temples and related organizations, including Bazan College, Hasadera, and uh, so on. Maybe the second major source was some of the early um, forms of uh, Japanese canons uh, that were formed. Uh, and then thirdly, later translations. The Korean canon, was based largely on a catalog from the Tang dynasty. Um, so later translations in the Yuan, Ming, and Qing dynasty were also added into the um, Taisho Tripitaka. Finally, there were several texts from modern archaeological expeditions um, in Central Asia from Dunhuang and discovered in Dunhuang. And here are the artifacts, a list of the major artifacts that were uh, included. Several texts from um, Kukai's uh, manuscript there uh, the Sanjuti Sakushi, um, Mandarin readings, uh, Sanshi uh, Tetsu, um, which is a 30 sheet work. Uh, and it wasn't included intact, it was kind of sheet by sheet um, into, uh, incorporated into the Taisho. These um, several other canons, Japanese canons, or um, works from them. In fact, the creators of the Taisho did extensive collation, comparison, 
and um, research on the, uh, the texts that were included in it. And they selected some from these other canons that were then included into the, um, included into the um, Taisha. Um, the Obaku canon based, which was based on the Ming uh, canon, um, the um, small print canon, which was a modern canon, and the supplementary Buddhist canon, which was another modern canon. And then the Yuan Ming and Qing versions, which um, supposedly based on um, you know, more modern um, versions um, of the Chinese canon, the Longzang, but actually, in fact, they may not have, I haven't been able to trace them to the Longzang, so I suspect they found them somewhere else in China. And then the Dunhuang manuscripts that I mentioned. Um, I think the themes are actually very interesting here of these. And as I mentioned, the creators of the Taishu did extensive research. And I think they were motivated by several um, themes here um, that we can see connected with the, their choices of things they, they put in there, uh, they included. Um, connections with historic Japanese figures. Kukai in particular has been the most prominent example, but some others as well, Saicho and so on. Um, and um, texts that were connected with those figures have been included into the Tai Show, and that they were not included in the Korean canon. Um, and also many of these texts, kind of overlapping the second bullet here, many of these texts included Siddham characters and drawings of mudras, mandalas, and other religious um, practices um, that especially Siddham characters, in fact, uh, we knew that Kukai um, practiced writing these Siddham characters and some of his manuscripts are included. Some describe important rituals that are important to certain schools um, in Japanese Buddhism, such as the Tendai sect that had some elaborate um, rituals that were described in texts that were not included in the uh, Korean canon that found their way into the Taisho. Uh, and then the, some of these texts that I um, mentioned that emerged since the Tang, the Havadra Tantra, which is a very important Tantra, uh, was included in the Taisho. And there's a, a number of other ones too. And then in addition, there was a number of different translations of, the, uh, of Indian texts with the same base text that had different Chinese translations. Here's an example um, of one. And it is uh, from the Wu Matrix Sanskrit Mantra, um, which is the Tai Zhang Fan Zi Zhen Yan. And we can see here, it's a mixture of uh, Chinese and Siddham. We can see the Chinese title here. Uh, this is the second scroll of the, of the work. And then we can see here the Siddham text here, which is, I think uh, got very important um, linguistic importance uh, there. And there's a number of other texts. Another example is the Great Pihen, Queen of Spells, Sanskrit text. Uh, and then here um, we have the, a number of drawings here, which have been actually, the drawings are sketches, but they are also reflected in some very uh, beautiful um, works of art, um, such as, they could see if we can go to this um, thing here, which was exhibited in the um, Metropolitan Museum of Art, this beautiful piece. Um, mandalas such as these that you can find in the, um, sketched in the canon are also, you know, have uh, uh, parallels in works of art, historic works of art there. And they're, fa they're fantastic works of art. Anyway, so um, see a lot of this biographical information there I collected and put on the NTI reader. You can browse it and search it in there. And um, please do that. And then finally, I want to mention here um, a, a movement uh, activity at the University of the West here initiative uh, for Lewis Lancaster Endowment Fund. and um, it is um, a research library and endowment fund to fund scholarships there and will be um, described uh, at the founding um, celebration there, the 30th anniversary celebration of the founding of the University of the West uh, on April 21. And in honor of uh, Dr. Lancaster, who is also the founder of ECHI and has done many uh, wonderful things. Um, and in fact, this uh, present, whole presentation, I. Um, you know, did in Lewis, um, Professor Lancaster's class last year on the canon. Um, so you can learn more about it at the link um, right there. And then I'm done. Thank you very much. Next speaker. The next speaker who is, um, let me do that. 
think I've stopped sharing now. Yeah. Okay, good. Now the next speaker, who is the next one? Maroj? Maroj, are you there? Okay, please share Maroj. You said? Yeah. Good. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Sure. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank David and Alex for organizing this panel in honor of Professor Lancaster. Today's my topic is Digital Sanskrit Buddhist Canon Project, Recent Development and Future Plan. So I'll try to introduce this project and also talk a little bit about Sanskrit Buddhist texts. Uh, in Nepal and recent deployment, rear Buddhist manuscript preservation project, Nepal manuscript transcription project, and new collaboration in future plan. Sanskrit Buddhist uh, works are of paramount importance for understanding the history of Buddhist literature. There are hundreds of Sanskrit Buddhist texts currently available throughout the world, although thousands are known to have existed in the past. Despite the disappearance of many Buddhist uh, Sanskrit texts. Due to various reasons, some of their content are preserved to an extent in Chinese and Tibetan translations. To preserve and disseminate the Sanskrit Buddhist texts remaining in the world, the University of West California, in cooperation with the Nagarjuna Institute of Buddhist Studies in Nepal, initiated the Digital Sanskrit Buddhist Canon Project in 2003. Digital Sanskrit Buddhist Canon Project was made possible through the sheer vision of the late Min Bahadur Sakya, director of Nagasan Institute of Ethical Meta, and Dr. Louis Lancaster, Professor Emeritus, University of California, Berkeley, also a former president of the Uni University of West in Los Angeles. And Venerable Master Shinyun, the founder of Fokonsan Kaohsiung, Taiwan, and the founder of University of West, kindly consented to sponsor this worthy project under the joint leadership of Dr. Lancaster and Mr. Saki. And Master Shinyun's aim in supporting this project was to make the original Sanskrit Buddhist text online for all free of cost. And whenever Master Shinyun has devoted his life to propagating humanistic Buddhism through education, culture, activity, charity, and religious practice. And this project was deemed wholly in line with his uh, mission of spreading humanistic Buddhism. The project named Digital Sanskrit Buddhist Canon, even though the complete Tipitaka in Sanskrit, the Sanskrit Canon proper had disappeared from the Buddhist world long ago. And this project aimed to reconstitute a Sanskrit Buddhist Canon in the 21st century by compiling all the Sanskrit Buddhist texts extant in the world and making a new comprehensive structure for those texts. And we have digitized so far 675 Buddhist texts title, which amount to more than 50,000 pages. And so far on our website, 430 texts, including 92 sutras and 15 binay and 323 sastras texts online. And the project uh, would create in the United States a complete Sanskrit record, which objective would be to unify all interpretation of Buddhist, Buddhism existing in Sanskrit, to make available sample of the original manuscript and to encourage and feedback on the canon from all people interested in Buddhists across the world. So existing Sanskrit manuscript, uh, Buddhist texts in Nepal. So Nepal has the largest repository of the Buddhist Sanskrit literature dealing with various aspects of Mayana creed and practice. And monastics, Vajracharya, priest, Pandita have contributed to producing and preserving Buddhist manuscript. And there are some major uh, collection uh, we can find in Kathmandu Valley. So there are National Archive Collection, Asa Archive Collection, Kesar Library Collection, Swimbu Library Collection, and our project, Rare Sanskrit Manus Manuscript Preservation Project. So far, we have digitized more than 600 manuscripts. And two, three years ago, uh, one of our friends, Sankar Thapa, who 
uh, did the work uh, with the British Library called Indenser Archive Pro Program. And he also digitized 200 plus manuscripts. National, Mar National Archive of Nepal. So they work with uh, National Ger Nepal German Manuscript Preservation Project. And so far they've had microfilm, uh, 180,000 man Nepalese manuscripts. And those catalogs are available online. Beside that, a uh, long time ago, National Archive also published a catalog of an essential Sanskrit Buddhist text numbering 1800. You can see some of the, their work. And in, in National Archive, so you can see some of the collection is uh, they're not, uh, people are not allowed to go in, but with the permission you can see and take a picture. But they, they have a 35,000 Hindu and Buddhist manuscript preserve. Asa Archive. So Asa Archive is a private collection and they are in collaboration with the Buddhist library of Japan Nogaya. They have completed the digitization of 7,025 titles of manuscript. And they are available in 53 cities and available for purchase. And recently, uh, the Japanese, uh, they donated the box, wooden box to, kept, uh, to preserve all the manuscripts and it's very well kept. Swimbu Library Collection. Swimbu Library is the uh, Swimbu is the one of the most sacred uh, site in the Kathmandu Valley, and Swimbu Library is next to the Harati Temple near Amitabha Shrine of the Swimbu. After the 2015 earthquake, many manuscripts of this um, library have damaged, and uh, this is my brother Milan Sai. So we uh, recently we are in contact with the director of the Swimbu Library. And we initiated a dialogue um, and asked them for permission to scan. And we are still in the process, but uh, we hope that we will get the permission. So they have a hundred plus uh, rare manuscript. And some are very useful. And the real Sanskrit Buddhist manuscript, uh, we have started this project in 2009. And uh, since we have only doing the digitization of the printed text, so there's a, a need or we start with thinking that, you know, we have to source people, the original, uh, the primary source for research. So we start doing the scanning of the manuscript in Kathmandu from 2009 till today. And we try to make this uh, modely, uh, more widely available through digital photography uh, for free. Some of you may have known that the National Archive, they charge for, if you want to get some folio, uh, you have to pay for that. Right? But in our project, so we will try to make it for free. So for in first phase, we have successfully scanned 400 manuscripts from the private collection. The one of the major private collection is from the Achyasar Mahavihara. Uh, this is the collection. And they have a 350 um, Hindu and Buddhist manuscript. And we have this as more than 200, only Buddhist text. And second phase, uh, we have collaborated uh, with the Buddhist Digital Resource Center in Cambridge, uh, house in the Harbor University. And we got a grant from them and we scanned 200 manuscripts. And these 200 manuscripts now uh, is available in the Buddhist Digital Resource Center library, uh, center uh, also and also our University of West uh, website. And we recently launched that website. And these are the input staff who work on this project. And also we got this um, uh, up-to-date um, the scanning material um, donated by uh, digital, digital, digital um, BDRC. And this is the website we launched in uh, October, 2021. So those 200 manuscripts you can uh, search and download. You can zoom in, zoom out, uh, and it's very readable. You can read without any problem. Nepal Manuscript Translation Project. 
And we have also collaborated with the Asian Legacy Library, which is known as ACIP, to, um, in 2019. The main reason why we collaborate with this, so lots of manuscripts are written in Nepali scripts. Um, there's a three scripts, and mostly uh, popular, but more than, uh, uh, it's called a Prachalit, Ujimol, Ranjana, or a popular one. And so it's not easy for foreigners to read and because it takes some uh, time to identify because most of the scholars are familiar with the Devanagari script. And so we start training uh, some of the Nepalese, uh, local Nepalese, and we hired him to transcribe those old manuscripts. And these are the first um, graduating class. And we are planning to train more students not only uh, local, but for foreigners too. It's a three month pro, uh, training program. So after three months, they will be able to read and write in Prajalit and Ranjana too. And these are a team, uh, some of them uh, we, uh, who got training, you know, we also hired in, and we also start training the new people. So their primary work uh, job is to trust a manuscript. Uh, and we use the software called iTrans, where we, uh, like they can read the Pachalit, uh, Ujimol and the Ranjana, and they can key in right away. And those, that software will transliterate in the two, two different, uh, the one is uh, Dev, uh, Devanagari, one is Roman, so you can get two results simultaneously. And uh, in just um, March, 2022, we just launched the new project called the Dharani Preservation Projects in collaboration with Asian Legacy Library. So we are trying to scan at least 108 Dharanis in this 2020. And after we scan, we also try to uh, digitize those Dharanis and we can uh, allow people to use it. Uh, Besides that, uh, we also collaborate with uh, the Bodhisur, a Melodious of Awakening. And so Bodhisur, so despite the wealth of Sanskrit Buddhist literature accessible to us today, but very little of it, it, it is available in audio form. And this project Bodhisur started of the personal interest and was initiated by uh, Christian Bernard in 2011. And DSBC, we are proud to par partner with this Project and we supply all the e-texts, uh, uh, the, all the sutra sastra and hymns. We share with them and they allow to us. So you can see in this website, uh, they put the music um, audio file here along with this text. So you can read <laughs> some. Next project is called a Buddhist Nexus project. So we collaborate with the University of Hamburg and they are doing um, not only Sanskrit, but uh, so this is a database they created uh, devoted to studying Buddhist texts and literally corpora in Pali, Sanskrit, Tibetan, Chinese, impassing the evolution of uh, scripture, formation of canon and intellectual network. So we are very proud to uh, partner with this big project. Uh, and this will be the one with the pioneer website for this uh, study of the Sanskrit and not only Sanskrit, but Palar text. Future plan. Uh, so we, there's lots of work to be done, uh, but uh, we want to uh, publish um, the Buddhist Sanskrit, uh, Buddhist canon, uh, DSBC in DVD form. So lots of people, um, especially in rural area, they are not able to use internet. So we try to make uh, this complete set of Sanskrit Buddhist texts in digital format, especially DVD format. And uh, next project is, and we also need to categorize, uh, there's lots of work to be done in terms of categorization of digital Sanskrit canon. And we want to create the comprehensive bibliography of Sanskrit Buddhist texts and also comprehensive catalog of Sanskrit Buddhist texts. Catalog, including uh, if it's recorded, scripted it's catalog, which is very important. And also the, some, we, we want to publish some of the diplomatic edition of unpublished, unpublished Sanskrit Buddhist texts. 
in the manuscript. So in the end, uh, we want to uh, publish like a whole Sanskrit Buddhist Tripitaka, which is like a very ambitious project. So we want other people to join in this meritorious activity. So in conclusion, uh, so digital Sanskrit Buddhist canon fills a gap in digitizing and preserving the unique Sanskrit Buddhist textual heritage that had been gradually disappearing from the world. So this project provides a stepping stone for the reconstitution of the Sanskrit Buddhist debate. Thank you very much. And do we have any more speakers? Otama, would you like to go? Is she? I don't see her. Yeah, I don't see her. Sorry. I don't see any messages. Yeah. Okay. Is there anybody else who? So it looks like that was um, the list of presenters that we have. There may have been one more person. Um, that hasn't made it today. If we have any questions, we could open it up to a, a um, Q and A. We do have David and Alex in the room, and and oh. awesome. And Marosh is online. So, does anyone have any questions before we close out this panel? Yes, yes. Deepak, go ahead. All right. First um, question goes to Alex, the first pre presenter, right? Come up. Yes. Oh, sure. Yeah. I'll come up. Yeah. I'll come up and answer. Good. There we go. Yeah. All right, Alex. Hey. hey. Yeah, please uh, go ahead. Yes. yes. Uh, speaking about you know uh, the Buddhist connection, um, uh, importations of uh, Buddhism from 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 South Asia, from India uh, to China, especially during the uh, uh, Tang period, you mentioned uh, the importation of of uh, Amoga Vajra. Uh, especially uh, you know, the Buddhist Amoga Vajra uh, during the Tang period. Um, I, I'm not an expert of uh, <laughs> um, you know, Chinese Buddhism at all, so please. Uh, but the, the the reason I'm interested in, because I teach a class, art history class, where when I teach, uh, you know, the spread of Buddhism in, in China, uh, especially in the Longmen uh, caves, uh, there is a major uh, cave uh, that is dedicated to um, uh, Vairochana. And uh, it has been uh, alleged that in order to fashion the, 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 the head of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, Vairochana, uh, the Empress uh, Wujutian uh, supplied her, you know, the impression of her, of her lips uh, so that, you know, the, the lips could be carved um, onto the face of the, of the Buddha. In other words, she's trying to identify herself uh, with, uh, you know, the, the universal Buddha because, uh, you know, Vairochana is the, the central Buddha within the, 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 the mandala, right? So he holds the central position. There is a, all, all kinds of articles have been written and I'm also interested from the political point of view, how she is being the first uh, female emperor. Uh, she may have had a lot of, you know, power struggles, difficulty. Now she is exerting her power, identifying herself with the universal Buddha. So that is what I have read. Now, do you have anything to say about, you know, the Vairochana Buddha's uh, presence in Longman Cave as opposed to Amogasiddhi? Yeah, 
Amoga Vajra. Amoga, yes. Well, I have a few thoughts on that. That certainly resonates with my understanding of um, Amoga Vajra and other um, master Indian masters in Tang China. Uh, they uh, were very. It was very much involved with politics, imperial politics, very, very much involved. It was uh, on the one hand sponsored um, by um, the, the imperial court and the emperors personally. And a lot of the services and uh, rituals were done for the emperor or, and the empress Wu Zetian, uh, the, the only empress um, in, in Chinese history, which um, I guess the Chinese word for emperor and empress is kind of the, the same word actually. Um, they don't have jonder in that um, term. Um, and um, definitely Wu Zetian was one of the major sponsors. And I don't have any knowledge of this specific um, thing. I have uh, been to Lumen and I've seen that carving and Wu Zetian sponsored many of the major um, statues at Lumen um, grottoes. As, and it's, she would not be the only um, emperor to have her image or personal impression on major grottoes. This also uh, happened um, in other grottoes and with other emperors as well. Um, so especially the Northern Wei dynasty was uh, especially, uh, it, you know, did that same thing, but not necessarily in relation to esoteric Buddhism. So it resonates, I don't know the specifics of this case you, you mentioned, but it, it does seem very consistent uh, with the, the um, movement and the tradition and the circumstances of esoteric Buddhism at that time in Tang China. Right. You know, the idea of uh, 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 Deva Raja, uh, which is a Hindu uh, concept, uh, declaring a king as God, you know, that comes from, from, from India, of course, you know, going all the way to, um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, Gupta dynasty, you know, in a, you know uh, with, a, with, a, with a Giri cave. And then, of course, we're going to uh, Southeast Asia, uh, all the way to Indonesia and all that. So it travels the idea of king uh, being God, right? The same idea. And of course, uh, China has picked it up and that we also saw, saw in, see in, um, uh, in, in Cambodia uh, the, you know, later on. So it is a kind of general thing. Uh, anyway, thank you for that. And- uh, Thank you very much for your question, Deepak. Thank you. And Show also I have a question for, uh, who, who, <laughs> okay. Um, to, uh, to, to Miroji, uh, to, to Dr. Shakya, um, the, um, the digitization project that you are talking about, you know, the, um, uh, the, especially the, the sound, the, uh, the recording of the, of, the, of the mantras, you know, in 1982, you know, a long time ago, um, in fact, I had a very good friend uh, from Taiwan, I have, uh, talk, I, have, I have spoken with my colleague, uh, David Blundell about this. And uh, he was a student at uh, Claremont uh, for many years. And he did his PhD and went back to uh, Taiwan, uh, became a Dean uh, of, his, uh, of his school, but he was a uh, you know, devout Buddhist. And he was always you know, practicing, you know, chanting uh, mantras in, in Chinese uh, when he found, found me <laughs> as a Nepali, and then he's speaking, you know, able to speak Sanskrit. Uh, and then, he, you know, he said, I'm not getting any uh, vibration, for any, any Siddhi from, from, from Chinese, pronouncing Chinese mantras. Could you, you know, read this mantra in Sanskrit? Uh, he gave it to me in a passage. And of course, I had no problem, you know, reading the, the, the Chinese uh, Sanskrit mantras. Then he sat uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a lotus position and then immediately then, you know, he had some kind of you know bodily vibration, and then, then you know I, I freaked. But any, any, anyway, he said, "Then you are my guru." Then he started you know <laughs> telling me and trying to you know learn all the Sanskrit mantras. And finally, after a year, we compiled about I think 108 uh, Buddhist mantras. Oh. Uh, you know, and then then he had me um, say that in in words. So he um, recorded. In those days, you know, in a spool uh, mm. tape, and then he sent those back to uh, Taiwan, mm. and then there was a, a Mahabihara, some kind of a, a Buddhist institution in, in in Taiwan, very rich, and then they produced uh, uh, something like two hundred thousand copies of uh, cassettes mm. uh, with my name on, and uh, all the printed labels and everything, and they also produced a book, and I do have a book 
-hmm. and I also have uh, several the, uh, the the audio cassettes, and then they were freely distributed worldwide. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I used to get you know uh, email uh, from all the way from Sri, uh, all the way from uh, Singapore and Malaysia, all the Chinese everywhere, you know, appreciating how good it is, you know, for the dharma and mm -hmm. all of that. So I do have those. If you would like to, you know, use some of that, I'm happy to donate. Yeah, on, wonderful. I would like to, you know, put put it on our website and All credit right. you. And I think this effort we really need to. You know, in China or in Taiwan, you know, they recite Sanskrit, uh, and they pop, print lots of uh, copy of the CD, and right. it become like a huge uh, heat. Right, you know? lots of people like a tapet so dharani. Mm -hmm. uh, but right. we we like we, in Nepal, India, we should do something, uh, recite and also share with everybody for free. So I think I I like this um, the Burnett uh, work. Uh, I, I think the, the, I think you may know the professor from the Sanskrit Hindu Bisubida, Kashinath Tamot Tamot Kashinath Tamot Kashinath. I think he he recited the whole. Uh, the, uh, sutra and Dharani for this website, Bodhisattva. I see. Kashinar. Mm -hmm. And so that website uh, is also, it's not popular, but um, but he did a lot of work on that, something, putting all the something in the website. So I also want to do <laughs> for our project. So. Mm -hmm. so I want to share your stuff. Okay. Right. Thank you. Is there any more questions? Anybody got any other questions? We've got a few minutes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we did. We um short of one percent. So let's maybe uh, wrap, give everybody a few minutes back. Yeah. Um, thank you all for joining. It's been fantastic, and appreciate everybody's attendance and participation here. And uh, David, do you have anything um to to say to wrap up? Or yeah, I think uh, you can uh, mention again about the twenty first of April. Yes, twenty first of April, the University of the West. The um anniversary of the founding and uh, and uh, dedication of the Lewis Lancaster Research Library and Endowment Fund. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is there on the University of the West website. And so please be there uh, for that. It'll be a fantastic event. And um, thank you, everybody. Let's um, close it up then. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.